38. The Bhikkhus rebuked. And it happened that the Blessed One walked up and down in the open air unshod. When the elders saw that the Blessed One walked unshod, they put away their shoes and did likewise. But the novices did not heed the example of their elders and kept their feet covered. Some of the brethren noticed the irreverent behavior of the novices and told the Blessed One, and the Blessed One rebuked the novices and said, If the brethren, even now, while I am yet living, show so little respect and courtesy to one another, what will they do when I have passed away? And the Blessed One was filled with anxiety for the welfare of the truth, and he continued, Even the layman, O Bhikkhus, who move in the world, pursuing some handicraft that they may procure them a living, will be respectful, affectionate, and hospitable to their teachers. 2. Yet, yeah, therefore, O Bhikkhus, so let your light shine forth, that yet, yeah, having left the world and devoted your entire life to religion and to religious discipline, may observe the rules of decency, be respectful, affectionate, and hospitable to your teachers and superiors, or those who rank as your teachers and superiors. Your demeanor, O Bhikkhus, does not conduce to the conversion of the unconverted and to the increase of the number of the faithful. It serves, O Bhikkhus, to repel the unconverted and to estrange them. I exhort you to be more considerate in the future, more thoughtful and more respectful. 39. Devadatta When Devadatta, the son of Superbuddha and a brother of Yasadhara, became a disciple, he cherished the hope of attaining the same distinctions and honors as Gotama Siddhartha. Being disappointed in his ambitions, he conceived in his heart a jealous hatred, and, attempting to excel the perfect one in virtue, he found fault with his regulations and reproved them as too lenient. Devadatta went to Rajgraha and gained the ear of Ajat Sato, the son of King Bimbisra. And Ajat Sato built a new vihar for Devadatta, and founded a sect whose disciples were pledged to severe rules and self-mortification. Soon afterwards the Blessed One himself came to Rajgraha and stayed at the Vilovana Vihar. Devadatta called on the Blessed One, requesting him to sanction his rules of greater stringency, by which a greater holiness might be procured. The body, he said, consists of its thirty-two parts and has no divine attributes. It is conceived in sin and born in corruption. Its attributes are liability to pain and dissolution, for it is impermanent. It is the receptacle of karma which is the curse of our former existences, it is the dwelling place of sin and diseases and its organs constantly discharge disgusting secretions. Its end is death and its goal. The charnel house. Such being the condition of the body it. Behooves us to treat it as a carcass full of abomination and to. Clothe it in such rags only as have been gathered in cemeteries. Or upon dung hills. The blessed one said, Truly, the body is full of impurity and. Its end is the charnel house for it is impermanent and destined to be dissolved into its elements. But being the receptacle of karma, 
it lies in our power to make it a vessel of truth and not of evil. It is not good to indulge in the pleasures of the body. But neither is it good to neglect our bodily needs and to heap filth upon impurities. The lamp that is not cleansed and not filled with oil will be extinguished, and a body that is unkempt, unwashed, and weakened by penance will not be a fit receptacle for the light of truth. Attend to your body and its needs as you would treat a wound which you care for without loving it. Severe rules will not lead the disciples on the middle path which I have taught. Certainly, no one can be prevented from keeping more stringent rules, if he sees fit to do so, but they should not be imposed upon anyone, for they are unnecessary. Thus the Tathagat refused Devadatta's proposal, and Devadatta left the Buddha and went into the Vihar speaking evil of the Lord's path of salvation as too lenient and altogether insufficient. When the Blessed One heard of Devadatta's intrigues, he said, Among men there is no one who is not blamed. People blame him. Who sits silent and him who speaks, they also blame the man who preaches the middle path. Devadatta instigated a Jat Sato to plot against his father, Bimbisra, the king, so that the prince would no longer be subject to him. Bimbisra was imprisoned by his son in a tower, where he died, leaving the kingdom of Magadha to his son. Ajat Sato. The new king listened to the evil advice of Devadatta, and he gave orders to take the life of the Tathagat. However, the murderers sent out to kill the Lord could not perform their wicked deed, and became converted as soon as they saw him and listened to his preaching. The rock hurled down from a precipice. Upon the great master split in twain, and the two pieces passed by on either side without doing any harm. Nailagiri, the wild elephant let loose to destroy the Lord, became gentle in his presence, and Ajat Sato, suffering greatly from the pangs of his conscience, went to the Blessed One and sought peace in his distress. The Blessed One received Ajat Sato kindly and taught him the way of salvation, but Devadatta still tried to become the founder of a religious school of his own. Devadatta did not succeed in his plans and having been abandoned by many of his disciples, he fell sick, and then repented. He entreated those who had remained with him to carry his litter to the Buddha, saying, Take me, children, take me to him, though I have done evil to him, I am his brother-in-law. For the sake of our relationship the Buddha will save me. And they obeyed, although reluctantly. And Devadatta in his impatience to see the Blessed One rose from his litter while his carriers were washing their hands. But his feet burned under him, he sank to the ground, and, having chanted a hymn on the Buddha, died. 40. Name and Form On one occasion the Blessed One entered the assembly hall and they Brethren hushed their conversation. When they had greeted him with clasped hands, they sat down and became composed. Then the Blessed One said, Your minds are inflamed with intense interest. What was the topic of your discussion? And Sariput rose and spake, World honored Master, we were discussing the nature of man's own existence. 
we were trying to grasp the mixture of our own being which is called name and form. Every human being consists of conformations, and there are three groups which are not corporeal. They are sensation, perception, and the dispositions, all three constitute consciousness and mind, being comprised under the term name. And there are four elements, the earthy element, the watery element, the fiery element, and the gaseous element, and these four elements constitute man's bodily form, being held together so that this machine moves like a puppet. How does this name and form endure? And how can it live? Said the Blessed One, life is instantaneous and living is dying. Just as a chariot wheel in rolling rolls only at one point of the tire, and in resting rests only at one point, in exactly the same way, the life of a living being lasts only for the period of one thought. As soon as that thought has ceased the being is said to have ceased. As it has been said, the being of a past moment of thought has lived, but does not live, nor will it live. The being of a future moment of thought will live, but has not lived, nor does it live. The being of the present moment of thought does live, but has not lived, nor will it live. As to name and form we must understand how they interact. Name has no power of its own, nor can it go on of its own impulse. Either to eat, or to drink, or to utter sounds, or to make a movement. Form also is without power and cannot go on of its own impulse. It has no desire to eat, or to drink, or to utter sounds, or to make a movement. But form goes on when supported by name, and name when supported by form. When name has a desire to eat, or to drink, or to utter sounds, or to make a movement, then form eats, drinks, utters sounds, makes a movement. It is as if two men, the one blind from birth and the other a cripple, were desirous of going traveling, and the man blind from birth were to say to the cripple as follows, See here. I am able to use my legs, but I have no eyes with which to see the rough and the smooth places in the road. And the cripple were to say to the man blind from birth as follows, See here. I am able to use my eyes, but I have no legs with which to go forward and back. And the man blind from birth, pleased and delighted, were to mount the cripple on his shoulders, and the cripple sitting on the shoulders of the man blind from birth were to direct him, saying, leave the left and go to the right, leave the right and go to the left. Here the man blind from birth is without power of his own, and weak, and cannot go of his own impulse or might. The cripple also is without power of his own, and weak, and cannot go of his own impulse or might. Yet when they mutually support one another it is not impossible for them to go. In exactly the same way name is without power of its own, and cannot spring up of its own might, nor perform this or that action. Form also is without power of its own, and cannot spring up of its own might, nor perform this or that action. Yet when they mutually support one another it is not impossible for them to spring up and go on. 
there is no material that exists for the production of name and form, and when name and form cease, they do not go any whither in space. After name and form have ceased, they do not exist anywhere in the shape of heaped up music material. Thus when a lute is played upon, there is no previous store of sound, and when the music ceases it does not go any whither in space. When it has ceased, it exists nowhere in a stored up state. Having previously been non existent, it came into existence on account of the structure and stem of the lute and the exertions of the performer, and as it came into existence, so it passes away. In exactly the same way, all the elements of being, both corporeal, and non-corporeal come into existence after having previously been non-existent, and having come into existence pass away. There is not a self residing in name and form, but the cooperation of the conformations produces what people call a man. Just as the word chariot is but a mode of expression for axle, wheels, the chariot body and other constituents in their proper combination, so a living being is the appearance of the groups, with the four elements as they are joined in a unit. There is no self in the carriage and there is no self in man. O Bhikkhus, this doctrine is sure and an eternal truth, that there is no self outside of its parts. This self of ours which constitutes name and form is a combination of the groups with the four elements, but there is no ego entity, no self in itself. Paradoxical though it may sound, there is a path to walk on. There is walking being done, but there is no traveler. There are deeds being done, but there is no doer. There is a blowing of the air, but there is no wind that does the blowing. The thought of self is an error and all existences are as hollow as the plantain tree and as empty as twirling water bubbles. Therefore, O Bhikkhus, as there is no self, there is no transmigration of a self, but there are deeds and the continued effect of deeds. There is a rebirth of karma, there is reincarnation. This rebirth, this reincarnation, this reappearance of the conformations is continuous and depends on the law of cause and effect. Just as a seal is impressed upon the wax reproducing the configurations of its device, so the thoughts of men, their characters, their aspirations are impressed upon others in continuous transference and continue their karma, and Good deeds will continue in blessings while bad deeds will continue in curses. There is no entity here that migrates, no self is transferred from one place to another, but there is a voice uttered here and the echo of it comes back. The teacher pronounces a stanza and the disciple who attentively listens to his teacher's instruction repeats the stanza. Thus the stanza is reborn in the mind of the disciple. The body is a compound of perishable organs. It is subject to decay, and we should take care of it as of a wound or a sore, we should attend to its needs without being attached to it, or loving it. The body is like a machine and there is no self in it that makes it walk or act, but the thoughts of it, as the windy elements, cause the machine to work. The body moves about like a cart. 
therefore tis said. As ships are by the wind impelled. As arrows from their bowstrings speed. So likewise when the body moves. The windy element must lead. Machines are geared to work by ropes. So too this body is, in fact. Directed by a mental pull. Wiener it stand or sit or act. No independent self is here. That could intrinsic forces prove. To make man act without a cause. To make him stand or walk or move. He only who utterly abandons all thought of the ego escapes the snares of the evil one, he is out of the reach of Mar. Thus says the pleasure promising tempter. So long as to the things called mine and I and me. Thine anxious heart still clings. My snares thou canst not flee. The faithful disciple replies. Not's mine and not of me. The self I do not mind. Thus mar, I tell thee. My path thou canst not find. Dismiss the error of the self and do not cling to possessions. Which are transient but perform deeds that are good for deeds are enduring and in deeds your karma continues since then o bhikkhus there is no self there cannot be any after life of a self therefore abandon all thought of self but since there are deeds and since deeds continue be careful with your deeds all beings have karma as their portion, they are heirs of their karma, they are sprung from their karma, their karma is their kinsmen, their karma is their refuge, karma allots beings to meanness or to greatness. Assailed by death in life's last throes on quitting all thy joys, and woes what is thine own, thy recompense. What stays with thee? When passing hence? What like a shadow follows thee and will? Beyond thine heirloom be? T is deeds, thy deeds, both good and bad, naught else can after. Death be had. Thy deeds are thine, thy recompense, they are thine. Own when going hence, they like a shadow follow thee and will. Beyond thine heirloom be. Let all then here perform good deeds, for future will a treasure. Store, there to reap crops from noble seeds, a bliss increasing. Evermore. 41. The Goal. And the Blessed One thus addressed the Bhikkhus. It is through not understanding the Four Noble Truths, O. Oh. Bhikkhus that we had to wander so long in the weary path of Sansar, both you and I. Through contact thought is born from sensation, and is reborn by a reproduction of its form. Starting from the simplest forms, the mind rises and falls according to deeds, but the aspirations of a Bodhisattva pursue the straight path of wisdom and righteousness until they reach perfect enlightenment in the Buddha. All creatures are what they are through the karma of their deeds done in former and in present existences. The rational nature of man is a spark of the true light, it is the first step on the upward road. But new births are required to Ensure an ascent to the summit of existence, the enlightenment of mind and heart, where the immeasurable light of moral comprehension is gained which is the source of all righteousness. Having attained this higher birth, I have found the truth and have taught you the noble path that leads to the city of peace. I have shown you the way to the lake of Ambrosia, which washes away all evil desire. I have given you the refreshing drink called the perception of 
truth, and he who drinks of it becomes free from excitement, passion, and wrongdoing. The very gods envy the bliss of him who has escaped from the floods of passion and has climbed the shores of nirvana. His heart is cleansed from all defilement and free from all illusion. He is like unto the lotus which grows in the water, yet not a drop of water adheres to its petals. The man who walks in the noble path lives in the world, and yet his heart is not defiled by worldly desires. He who does not see the four noble truths, he who does not understand the three characteristics and has not grounded himself in the uncreate, has still a long path to traverse by repeated births through the desert of ignorance with its mirages of illusion and through the morass of wrong. But now that you have gained comprehension, the cause of further migrations and aberrations is removed. The goal is reached. The craving of selfishness is destroyed, and the truth is attained. This is true deliverance, this is salvation, this is heaven and the bliss of a life immortal. 42. Miracles Forbidden Jodaka, the son of Subhada, was a householder living in Rajgraha. Having received a precious bowl of sandalwood decorated with jewels, he erected a long pole before his house and put the bowl on its top with this legend, Should a Samama take this bowl down without using a ladder or a stick with a hook, or without climbing the pole, but by magic power, he shall receive as reward whatever he desires. And the people came to the Blessed One, full of wonder and there mouths overflowing with praise, saying, Great is the Tathagat. His disciples perform miracles. Kasapa, the disciple of the Buddha, saw the bowl on Jodaka's pole, and, stretching out his hand, he took it down, carrying it away in triumph to the Vihar. When the Blessed One heard what had happened, he went to Kasapa and, breaking the bowl to pieces, forbade his disciples to perform miracles of any kind. Soon after this it happened that in one of the rainy seasons many Pikas were staying in the Vaji territory during a famine. And one of the Pikas proposed to his brethren that they should Praise one another to the householders of the village, saying, This Pikhu is a saint, he has seen celestial visions, and that Pikhu possesses supernatural gifts, he can work miracles. And the villagers said, It is lucky, very lucky for us, that such saints are spending the rainy season with us. And they gave willingly and abundantly, and the Bhikkhus prospered and did not surfer from the famine. When the Blessed One heard it, he told Ananda to call the Bhikkhus together, and he asked them, Tell me, O Bhikkhus, when does a Bhikkhu cease to be a Bhikkhu? And Sariput replied, an ordained disciple must not commit any unchaste act. The disciple who commits an unchaste act is no longer a disciple of the Sakyamuni. Again, an ordained disciple must not take except what has been given him. The disciple who takes, be it so little as a penny's worth, is no longer a disciple of the Sakyamuni. And lastly, an ordained disciple must not knowingly and malignantly deprive any harmless creature of life, not even an earthworm or an ant.
the disciple who knowingly and malignantly deprives any harmless creature of its life is no longer a disciple of the Sakyamuni. These are the three great prohibitions. And the Blessed One addressed the Bhikkhus and said, There is another great prohibition which I declare to you. An ordained disciple must not boast of any superhuman perfection. The disciple who with evil intent and from covetousness boasts of a superhuman perfection, be it celestial visions or miracles, is no longer a disciple of the Sakyamuni. I forbid you, O Bhikkhus, to employ any spells or supplications. For they are useless, since the law of karma governs all things. He who attempts to perform miracles has not understood the doctrine of the Tathagat. 43. The Vanity of Worldliness There was a poet who had acquired the spotless eye of truth, and he believed in the Buddha, whose doctrine gave him peace of mind and comfort in the hour of affliction. And it happened that an epidemic swept over the country in which he lived, so that many died, and the people were terrified. Some of them trembled with fright, and in anticipation of their fate, were smitten with all the horrors of death before they died. While others began to be merry, shouting loudly, let us enjoy ourselves today, for we know not whether tomorrow we shall live, yet was their laughter no genuine gladness, but a mere pretense and affectation. Among all these worldly men and women trembling with anxiety, they Buddhist poet lived in the time of the pestilence, as usual, calm and undisturbed helping wherever he could and ministering unto the sick, soothing their pains by medicine and religious consolation. And a man came to him and said, My heart is nervous and excited, for I see people die. I am not anxious about others, but I tremble because of myself. Help me, cure me of my fear. The poet replied, There is help for him who has compassion on others, but there is no help for thee so long as thou clingest to thine own self alone. Hard times try the souls of men and teach them righteousness and charity. Canst thou witness these sad sights around thee and still be filled with selfishness? Canst Thou see thy brothers, sisters, and friends suffer, yet not. Forget the petty cravings and lust of thine own heart. Noticing the desolation in the mind of the pleasure-seeking man, the Buddhist poet composed this song and taught it to the brethren in the Vihar. Unless refuge you take in the Buddha and find in Nirvana rest, your life is but vanity empty and desolate vanity. To see the world is idle, and to enjoy life is empty. The world, including man, is but like a phantom, and the hope of heaven is as a mirage. The worldling seeks pleasures fattening himself like a caged fowl. But the Buddhist saint flies up to the sun like the wild crane. The fowl in the coop has food but will soon be boiled in the pot. No provisions are given to the wild crane, but the heavens and the earth are his. The poet said, the times are hard and teach the people a lesson, yet do they not heed it. And he composed another poem on the vanity of worldliness. It is good to reform and it is good to exhort people to reform. The things of the world will all be swept away. Let others be busy and buried with care. 
My mind all unvexed shall be pure. After pleasures they hanker and find no satisfaction. Riches they covet and can never have enough. They are like unto puppets held up by a string. When the string breaks they come down with a shock. In the domain of death there are neither great nor small. Neither gold nor silver is used, nor precious jewels. No distinction is made between the high and the low. And daily the dead are buried beneath the fragrant sod. Look at the sun setting behind the western hills. You lie down to rest, but soon the cock will announce. Mourn. Reform today and do not wait until it be too late. Do not say it is early, for the time quickly passes by. It is good to reform and it is good to exhort people to reform. It is good to lead a righteous life and take refuge in the Buddha's name. Your talents may reach to the skies, your wealth may be untold. But all is in vain unless you attain the peace of nirvana. 44. Secrecy and Publicity The Buddha said, Three things, O disciples, are characterized by Secrecy, love affairs, priestly wisdom, and all aberrations from The Path of Truth Women who are in love, O disciples, seek secrecy and shun Publicity Priests who claim to be in possession of special revelations, O disciples, seek secrecy and shun publicity, all those who stray from the path of truth, O disciples, seek secrecy and shun publicity. Three things, O disciples, shine before the world and cannot be hidden. What are the three? The moon, O disciples, illumines the world and cannot be hidden. The sun, O disciples, illumines the world and cannot be hidden. And the truth proclaimed by the Tathagat illumines the world and cannot be hidden. These three things, O disciples, illumine the world and cannot be hidden. There is no secrecy about them. 45. The Annihilation of Suffering And the Buddha said, What, my friends, is evil? Killing is evil, stealing is evil, yielding to sexual passion is evil, lying is evil, slandering is evil, abuse is evil, gossip is evil, envy is evil, hatred is evil. To cling to false doctrine is evil, all these things, my friends, are evil. And what, my friends, is the root of evil? Desire is the root of evil, hatred is the root of evil, illusion is the root of evil, these things are the root of evil. What, however, is good? Abstaining from killing is good. Abstaining from theft is good. Abstaining from sensuality is good. Abstaining from falsehood is good. Abstaining from slander is good. Suppression of unkindness is good. Abandoning gossip is good. Letting go all envy is good. Dismissing hatred is good. Obedience to the truth is good. All these things are good. And what, my friends, is the root of the good? Freedom from desire is the root of the good, freedom from hatred. And freedom from illusion, these things, my friends, are the root of the good. What, however, O oh brethren, is suffering? What is the origin of suffering? What is the annihilation of suffering? Birth is suffering, old age is suffering, disease is suffering. Death is suffering, sorrow and misery are suffering, 
affliction, and despair are suffering, to be united with loathsome things is suffering, the loss of that which we love and the failure in attaining that which is longed for our suffering, all these things, O oh brethren, are suffering. And what, O oh brethren, is the origin of suffering? It is lust, passion, and the thirst for existence that yearns for pleasure everywhere, leading to a continual rebirth. It is sensuality, desire, selfishness, all these things, O oh brethren, are the origin of suffering. And what is the annihilation of suffering? The radical and total annihilation of this thirst and the abandonment, the liberation, the deliverance from passion, that, O oh brethren, is the annihilation of suffering. And what, O oh brethren, is the path that leads to the annihilation of suffering? It is the holy eightfold path that leads to the annihilation of suffering, which consists of right views, right decision, right speech, right action, right living, right struggling, right thoughts, and right meditation. In so far, O oh friends, as a noble youth thus recognizes suffering, and the origin of suffering, as he recognizes the annihilation of suffering, and walks on the path that leads to the annihilation of suffering, radically forsaking passion, subduing wrath, annihilating the vain conceit of the I am, leaving ignorance, and attaining to enlightenment, he will make an end of all suffering even in this life.